the scary stories will start in 40 seconds. Before they do, I just want to remind you to subscribe to my channel. I am 100% committed to making your listening experience as scary and as relaxing as it can be, always with minimal ads. This is volume 50, and I am joined by an exclusive special guest, Leon Lush. He is going to kick things off with the first story, and then I will read the rest. I hope you enjoy. Hey, Being Scared, this is Leon Lush, and I'm pumped to be reading this story here for you guys. So let's get right into it. This happened to my family in early 2002, when my daughter was a baby. My wife and I had moved into a new house right after our daughter was born. It was a nice place, in a nice suburban neighborhood. The house was relatively new and surrounded by other houses with the exact same design and layout. We were still getting used to our new life there, with our new baby, when one night we heard the baby crying on the baby monitor. We were watching a movie in the living room, paused it, and went into the baby's room. The baby wanted her bottle. I stood in the doorway of the room while my wife tended to our newborn. I was smiling at the sight of this when suddenly my wife made a small sound of fear and surprise. She was looking out the window directly beside the crib. I walked over to her and she didn't say anything. I looked outside and saw a woman that looked to be our age standing on our lawn and looking into the bedroom window. I went into protective mode and immediately walked out the room and towards the front door with the intention of confronting this woman. My wife shouted before I could open the door. She ran away. I ripped the door open and walked outside. I looked around the front of our house and walked a bit further onto the street looking in both directions. No sign of her. I decided to walk around my whole house to make sure this creepy woman had left. I walked the perimeter of our house and didn't find her. I came back inside the house to find my wife still holding the baby in her master bedroom and told her I hadn't seen her. After a little while of being creeped out and looking out the windows to make sure she wasn't still lingering around, we decided she was gone for good and went to sleep. The next day, we saw the woman again, this time at night and this time my wife was in the shower and I was holding our baby in her bedroom. I saw the woman standing in the same spot on our lawn, peering into the bedroom at me holding my baby. I just looked at her for the longest time and she didn't move. My wife eventually walked into the room with a towel in her hair and approached me from behind, giving me a hug. I said, she's back. Who does this? My wife got incredibly creeped out at this point and insisted that we call the police. I was going to, but I felt I wanted to confront her again, so I walked out of the room and opened up the front door, which was only about ten feet away from the baby's room. I walked outside, and the woman was still there. She turned to me. I walked onto our lawn, about twenty feet away from her, and said, If you don't leave right now, I'm calling the cops. The woman smiled at me, and then opened her mouth wide and let out a nightmare-inducing scream that sounded as if she was in pain. I knew right away that this woman was ill, like in the head. She turned around and ran away. This was terrifying as I realized she was barefoot. She ran away like a little kid would, arms flailing. I went inside and my wife was already holding the phone. A couple of police officers came by the house a short while later and they said there was really nothing they could do except drive around the neighborhood a few times and keep an eye out for her. They said they would call us if they located her. About 30 minutes after they left, they called and said they didn't see anyone fitting her description. We were disappointed, but eventually went on with our night. I had assumed the woman got the hint. A month had passed with no sign of her. Then one night, my wife and I were in bed when I heard a noise. I awoke and glanced at the alarm clock. It read 3.48 a.m. I listened for the noise to continue and heard giggling coming from the baby monitor. I sat up in my bed and my heart stopped. I flew out of my room and into my baby's room to see nothing. My baby was asleep and my wife had followed me. I was very confused for a moment and thought maybe I hadn't actually heard anything. Maybe it was just a dream. My wife asked what was wrong and I didn't respond for a few seconds and then finally said, nothing, I thought I heard something. We both sighed and walked back into our room. My wife went into the room first and upon entering screamed and then threw herself backwards into me. I gasped and almost fell backwards onto the floor. I shouted out, what, what? I forced my way past her and walked into my bedroom. 
the woman was sitting Indian style on our bed, smiling up at me. I backed out of the room and slammed the door. My wife ran and took our baby from her crib and the three of us went outside. As I was closing the front door once we had walked out, I heard our master bedroom door open. Neither of us had our cell phones on us, so we ran to our neighbor's house and started frantically knocking on their front door. They answered very quickly and asked what the matter was. We explained and they ushered us inside and called the police. The cops showed up shortly after and they went inside of our house. The woman was still in there. They said they had found her upstairs sitting in the middle of the hallway in the dark. When I was 24 years old, I experienced something so strange, so scary, that I just had to write about it and share it with the world. It is absolutely true and was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me in my life. I was traveling at the time, going to visit my best friend who had moved a few states away from me to go to college. I was driving in Ohio, if I remember correctly, I was on a long highway that stretched across the state when out of nowhere, my car died. I shifted to the side of the road where I eventually came to a stop. I didn't run out of gas. I had just filled up at the last town. I tried starting my car and I was very happy when it actually started. I was confused and was worried about why it just died on me. As I started to pick up speed and get back on track, my car started making weird noises and it sounded like something was grinding on something else. I looked up and saw a sign that showed that there was a gas station and food at the next exit. My car was moving, but with this grinding noise, I decided to get off the highway and take a look at it at the next gas station. There were only two places off this exit that I could see. A gas station with one pump and an old looking diner not too far off next to it. I pulled into the gas station and it looked closed. I checked my watch and quickly realized that this was very strange considering it was 2.30 p.m. What kind of gas station closes before this time, I wondered. I got out of my car and approached the glass door entrance to the station. I put my hands up and cupped the glass around my eyes to see inside. The place looked abandoned. It was obvious nobody was there. And I turned and looked around me. I felt a bit uneasy at this moment when I saw that no other people or cars were around. What the heck? Where am I? I checked my phone and of course, I had no service. I looked up at the sky and it was white. The clouds were moving fiercely, and it was extremely cold outside. I decided to get back in my car and drive it over to the diner nearby. When I reached the place, I thought for sure it was closed as well. But to my surprise, before I could even reach the door after getting out of my car, an older woman opened the door to the diner and greeted me with a smile. She looked nice, and I was so relieved to see someone else and maybe get some hot food in my stomach. She said hello and asked if it was just me and if I wanted a booth, blah blah blah. I told her yes, it was only me and a booth sounded great. This diner looked very old fashioned and there was no other customers inside. The woman showed me to my seat and I scooted into the booth. I looked up at her and she was wearing an old apron with stains all over it. Her teeth were old, yellow, and cracked. She had a pleasant voice though, and seemed to be a very nice person. She handed me a menu and asked what I would like to drink. I told her a Coke or a Pepsi would be great, and she smiled and said that she would be right back. I sat there looking at this menu, and there was dirt on it. It looked like it had been sitting outside for years. I cleaned it off, and the food that was available on it was very basic. Burger, chicken sandwich, fries, and a salad. And that was pretty much it. I decided to order the burger with fries. A few minutes passed, and the woman hadn't returned with my drink yet. I was anxious to ask her if there was a mechanic around 
to look at my car. A few more minutes passed, and I started thinking, what is going on back there? I yelled out, uh, hello, in as nice a voice I could manage. No response came. At this point, I was annoyed and got up. I walked over to the door that led into the back cooking area and swung it open, about to ask where my drink was. The back of the diner was empty. There were no cooks, no fryers, no grills, nothing. The woman was nowhere in sight. It was obvious that this diner was not a running establishment, and I felt sick to my stomach. I started to walk into the back area when I heard the scariest, most evil old lady laugh I've ever heard. I stopped and backed up out the door into the front. I turned and walked out the door I came in from. I ran down the three steps over to my car and got inside. Thankfully my car started immediately and I floored it out of there. As I was driving away, I looked into my rear view mirror and saw the woman standing in the middle of the road. I took in a puppy a few months ago. Her original owners weren't able to bond with her, said that she was unresponsive and disobedient, and didn't have the look that they wanted. I have no idea what they were talking about. She's the best behaved dog I have ever known, and she's downright adorable, so I'm used to people stopping me in the street so they can pet her. Usually people will ask before they touch her, or at the very least, they'll say something like, Oh, look at that dog, to let me know that they're obviously going to come over and say hi to her. I'm pretty much fine with that. What I'm not fine with is what happened on one of my earlier walks with her. I live in a tiny seaside town, one of those places where the location is beautiful, and I like to take my dog on a tour of all the areas closest to the sea when I walk her. We'll walk along the beach, down the promenade, around the miniature lakes, and then home. Probably not smart to stick to the same route every day, but I've switched things up since then. We were at the final stage of our walk, making a couple laps around the lakes, when we walked past a man. Now a lot of old men gather there on a regular basis. I didn't think much of one guy sitting on a bench by the water. I told myself that he was staring, because my dog was cute. I just passed him by. Then, from behind me, I hear him say, Sit. And my dog who is much more obedient than her previous owners let on, sits down and looks up at me all happy and expecting a treat. I look back at the guy and frown, and I see that he is still on the bench and quickly encourage my puppy to start walking again. We haven't even gotten five feet further down the path before the man says again, Sit! And my dog does. I turn around again, already glaring, and see that the man is now on his feet. I tell my dog to keep walking and pick up the pace, trying to get over to the path that leads up to the main street. We're still nowhere near the path when the man yells, Sit! And my dog does. She's starting to look confused, and I'm pretty much terrified. He's now walking towards us, and he's catching up fairly quickly. He's close enough that even without my glasses, I can tell that he's grinning. At that point, I had had enough. I forgot about getting to the path. I just scooped up my dog off the ground, ran straight up the hill to the side of us, and climbed over the little fence that separates the lakes from the street. The man didn't follow, but stayed at the bottom of the hill looking up at us not smiling anymore. I had never seen him before and haven't seen him since, and I hope it stays that way. I don't know exactly what his intentions were, but it seemed to me 
like he was using my dog's obedience to slow me down, to keep me from getting away from him, so I doubt they were good. Glad I didn't stick around to find out. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington near Mount Rainer. Like, not an official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night I wake up and hear something, open my tent, and there is a guy sitting by where my fire had been, right outside my tent. Nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude just sitting there a couple feet from my tent. No bag or pack or anything with him. Just a guy. He saw me open my tent. His eyes got huge, like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly, but over the next day, I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well, after writing it off as just some odd occurrence, and a guy that was probably high or something, and had somehow managed to set up a camp, coincidentally not far from mine. Then, two days after that, and 10 to 15 miles away in totally random directions that nobody could take the same path as on accident, I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises that got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them, and out of the darkness someone said, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said no. I don't even think that's a real place there. They kept talking from just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, but they yelled, Aim that away. And, kind of spooked, and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person, I did. After like 15 minutes of me being very freaked out, and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer. So I shined my light that way again, and it was the same guy who had been outside my tent two nights before. He had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days, because there is no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot as vast as this wilderness is. No possible way. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. I started to chase him, but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark, so I stopped quickly after probably only 100 to 200 feet. This one couldn't be written off, because the only way he could have been in both places is specifically if he was following me. I decided the trip was over, first thing in the morning and hiked back out over three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anyone following off my trail, and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me. I really can't describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods, and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid potentially being murdered. On the first night of hiking out, Twice I heard what sounded like a person walking circles around my tent, but by the time I mustered the courage to look, nobody was there. On the second night, I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first in the distance, but slowly decided it sounded much more like a human making animal calls, but could have actually been an animal, but I didn't actually see the guy again but it really sounded like a person making howling noises. I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day, probably the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were and no way of ever getting an explanation, but I really can't articulate just what a terrifying few days it was. So when I was about 15 or so, I would always go grocery shopping with my mom. 
This time, she didn't just need groceries, but some other things that weren't super close by. We lived out in the country, and the closest town didn't have what she needed, so we went to the bigger town, about an hour away. Our last stop was the grocery store, as my mom didn't want to leave a bunch of groceries in the car on a hot summer day. While we were there, I noticed an older man, tall, skinny, that looked ill, and that was paying a lot of attention to us. I also caught him talking to himself a lot. I almost ran into him when we were switching aisles, and I said sorry, and since then, I had seen him like five times, and every time, I felt a shudder, and I would look around and he would be somewhere, staring at me. I told my mom, and she said we were almost done. A few minutes later, we got distracted talking about ice cream. I was telling her about this ice cream brand that my brother, who's a health nut, told me about, and that it was supposed to be a lot better for you than well-known name brands. We started searching for it. I was on one end of the aisle, and she was on the other. I ended up finding it, and reached into the freezer to grab it. When I turned around, the old man was right behind me, like way too close. I could feel his breath on my face. He said something like, You're too pretty to be eating that. It'll rot your teeth. And I freaked. I pushed past him and ran back over to my mom and said, Found it. Let's go. And she saw the look on my face and looked past me and saw the man. We headed quickly for the registers, and unfortunately, we had a lot of groceries, and the old man got in line next to us, and only had a few things. He kept talking to himself. I was keeping a very close eye on him, and was relieved when he exited the store. But unfortunately, that wasn't the end of it. When we left the store, I noticed him sitting in his car outside the doors. He sat there and watched us put the groceries in the car and got behind us as we went to leave the parking lot. I was freaking out. My mom told me it would be okay and that she was right there with me. We ended up taking some back roads home. My mom thought maybe he would get lost. As I said, we were about an hour away from home and the back roads made it even longer. We were about five to 10 minutes away from home and he was still following us. When I asked my mom if I should call the cops, she said no, call your dad and tell him what's going on. Tell him to be waiting outside with the shotgun. So I called my dad and told him what was happening, and he had an idea. Since we lived way out in the country, my parents' neighbors were about half a mile down the road from us. They had a long driveway to where you couldn't see their house from the road. He told me to have my mom go there instead so that the guy wouldn't know where we lived. My dad got there first, told the neighbor what was going on, and they both grabbed their shotguns and waited outside for us to pull up. The guy followed us down the long dirt driveway, and as soon as he got to the clearing with the house and saw my dad and our neighbor with their shotguns out, he threw his car into reverse and hightailed it out of there. I had already memorized the license plate number and told my dad after we got home. He called and gave the plate number to the cops. I don't know what came of it after that. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no street lights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, 
as I had never smelled that before around my house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just gotten off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 o'clock yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later, sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone screen and number pad blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark. And this particular phone was so bright, I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was nine something at night, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one I was in, a spare bedroom, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever it was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. I was so thankful he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic access in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room, which just had some boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone was hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic, just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away, and I heard a loud crash come from my room, followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather, who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put into a mental hospital for several mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet, and I wasn't certain that I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1,000, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over, I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise I had heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all of the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were laying all over the floor. 
The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened, and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell, though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line, along with some foil and an empty pen tube, which the police said people often used to smoke meth, so they think that he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected the evidence and told me I should stay with my friends or family that night and to get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day, I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though. I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet, and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved. Except now, I go to a crawl space at the back of the closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting into the attic, or if he hadn't gone into the bathroom at the end of the hall first. First off, let me preface, this is a completely true story that happened to me in the summer of 2009. Some of what I did, or my reasoning for what I did, is a little hazy because this was 11 years ago, but the events are all true. I was 18 years old, I'm a male, and it was my final year in high school. I was optimistic for the future, but truth be told, I was also lonely. I had never been kissed. Blame it on having a disability. Don't get me wrong, I had gone on dates with girls, but I was also friend-zoned. So I decided enough was enough and I was going to finally be with a girl, even if I had to pay for it. Blame it on my raging hormones. Since I lived in a town of 10,000 people, there were obviously no escorts there, or at least any I knew of. So I took to Craigslist and went on to the adult services section of a neighboring city in a different state. This was a year before the US federal government forced Craigslist to shut down their adult section. As I scrolled through the adult ads of beautiful women and their salacious posts, a gorgeous brunette caught my eye. I texted her and through a series of texts, we set up a meetup. Since my car was verging on near death, the escort offered to drive the hour to my town. We planned it for a day that my parents would be out of town. The day finally arrived. I was a mix of emotions. Nervous, anxious, lascivious. A black Jetta pulled up into my driveway, and I nervously swallowed hard, ready to have my first intimate experience. When I opened my front door to meet her, I was met with a girl who looked nothing like the escort ad. I was catfished. She wasn't ugly or anything, she just didn't look like the pictures and wasn't exactly somebody I wanted to pay $300 to. There was a moment of awkwardness as I struggled to speak, caught off guard by this catfisher. Hey baby, can I come in? She questioned as she inched her way forward. Oh, uh, sure, sure, I nervously said as I let her into my house. I was filled with panic. I had no idea what to do. I began to brainstorm for a solution, but couldn't think of anything. 
So where's your room? She asked as she looked around my home. Oh, it's downstairs, I muttered. We went downstairs to my room, and I had no idea what to do. I finally got up the courage to speak. Hey, I don't mean to be rude, but I'm not feeling it. I can give you gas money for your troubles, but... I tried explaining as politely as possible, but she cut me off. No, baby, we agreed on 300, she said firmly. I understand, but I'm... I once again tried explaining, but she once again interjected. I'm not going anywhere until I get that 300, she stated in a matter-of-fact tone. I was at a loss for words. I felt like I was a prisoner in my home and felt like I was under duress. I had no way of getting her peacefully out. I could not drag her out as I was so nervous that she would use this meetup against me and obviously she would press assault charges against me if I forcibly removed her. It would not be a good way to start my senior year. Then an idea popped into my head. I would lure her out of my house and then lock her out. I would pretend to drive to the bank and have her follow me and then I would lose her, go back to my home and lock her out and she would get the hint that I wasn't interested. Okay, I said as I began to reiterate out loud the plan from my head. I can give it to you. The thing is, it's in my bank. That was actually true, because I had planned for this incident to happen. If I was going to be catfished, I would only give her $50 for gas, as that would be all I had on me. If she was the actual girl, I would have gone down to my bank to get the money out. This was when smartphones were only just becoming popular, and I only had one of those easily breakable flip phones, so I didn't have an app to send money to her. She fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. We got into our individual cars and began to drive to my bank. The way my hometown is situated is that there is a main highway that runs through the town which connects to the freeway. As we got close to where the bank was, I hurried and turned right onto the freeway on-ramp. I began to laugh out loud, thinking that I would lose her. To my absolute horror, I looked into my rearview mirror and she was pursuing me. She really wanted that $300. I hit the gas pedal and went up to 80 miles per hour. She easily followed along. I was so scared, mostly because my 1995 Pontiac was so old that I was afraid it would fall apart at that speed. I began to motion with my hand for her to go away, but she kept following me. I looked at my gas tank monitor and I was fine with gas, but I didn't know how much longer she would follow me, and I didn't want to drive to the next town, which was 30 minutes away. So I turned off onto an exit, trying to turn around, and insanely, she still followed me. Deciding that this was going to go nowhere, I decided that I would try reasoning with her outside the bank, which was inside the local Walmart. We pulled into the Walmart parking lot, and I got out to talk to her and she boxed me in by parking in front of my car so that I couldn't get out. Cut it out. I want my money, she firmly stated. I was a scared 18-year-old. I didn't know what to do, so I gave in. I was tired of trying to evade her. I felt incredibly stupid for the mess I had got myself in, so I decided to just comply. I went into the bank, looking like I was in a you have 10 minutes to get the money or your family will die situation. I should have gotten help. I should have told the teller what was going on, but I was so scared. I came back out and I gave her the money. She begrudgingly said thanks and then drove off. I was sad because I wanted intimacy and for an 18 year old high school kid, 300 is a lot of money. So does the story end here? Nope. Later that night, my dog began barking. I went upstairs to check on my beautiful golden lab to see what he was barking at. I patted his head and then went to the window that oversaw my driveway. 
and saw that there was a black car idling. My heart sank. Was it her? I couldn't tell, and I didn't want to know. I went to my kitchen, retrieved a knife, got my dog, and went down to my room and closed the door. I was so scared of what I had done that calling the police frightened me. I sat up all night waiting for a window to be smashed in and for me to ward off intruders. But nothing happened. The next morning, I examined my home and there was no damage. No black car was in my driveway either. I breathed a sigh of relief, ready to put this behind me. I decided after that day that I would never use Craigslist again to find an escort, which was a short-lived promise. I tried retelling my experience shortly after to my friends, but nobody believed me. And I sure as heck wasn't going to tell my parents. So does the story end here? Nope. A few months later, my family and I went to the neighboring city to watch a movie in a nice theater. The theater was located in a nice outdoor mall. As we were strolling along, a lady began shouting across the street. I turned to see what the commotion was, and to my horror, it was the escort. She was standing with another young woman, and she was yelling incoherent things in my direction. I instantly put my head down, trying to ignore her. I was so afraid that she was going to recreate that one scene in the movie The Ringer, when Johnny Knoxville pretends to be mentally challenged, and he's with his quote-unquote caretaker, and then his high school acquaintance runs up to him, saying hi. I gritted my teeth and was saying under my breath, Please no, please no, please no. Is she yelling at us? My mom remarked. No idea, I replied. To my relief, the woman didn't follow us, probably because I didn't have $300 on me. For those of you who may think that this is all just a fabricated event, I asked my brother the other day if he remembered the woman yelling at us at the mall. He said that he vaguely remembered. I told him what I just told you. So now you're wondering, did you ever see that woman again? Not in person, no. But, four years later, there was a woman featured on the news who had gone to a man's house as an escort, and when he felt hesitant to give her money, she ransacked his home and had her male friends come over and threaten him. It was her. My heart sank, and I felt sick, as it dawned on me that that could have been me. So many questions filled my mind. Was that why there was a black car in my driveway that night? Why did they not come attack me as well? Or was it just some random car who decided to pull into my driveway? I will never know, and I'm glad I didn't find out. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning, and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We would only come out for school. We loved pretending we were frontiersmen. We would build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie of the same name that had just come out. The idea was that we would walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we would find cool bridges to fish from and a camp a little ways off the tracks. Of course we knew this was dangerous and we would likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. We hid from trains. At night we camped in the woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun, we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. 
After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch, and always tried to coordinate visits so that we would see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We would do stuff with family in the day, and at night, we would either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand-by-me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a hell of a mix. Soon we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came. We started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off at our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we'd take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, and we had a map, so I said, yeah, let's do it, and off we went. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint, and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days, too. We would walk the area around a little bit to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from on top of this short hill, we would be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be a clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it, either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews, and a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot that we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point, it was dusk, and we just decided to rig up our hammocks, go to sleep, and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and talked, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What is that? It sounds like... people singing. And it did sound like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. 
Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so that you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, Can you believe this? The light looked to be candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in a foreign language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually it got to where the single male voice would say something and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears and then it stopped. At this point I was just getting ready to say, Let's get out of here. When Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, They're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't make them out really well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff, and ran to the train tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill. They were moving erratically, like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town was about 15 minutes down it and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices and they did not sound like kids to me. Not sure who those people were but it was definitely the creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. My uncle went to a rural college. The campus was in the middle of a town of about 10,000 people. Most were college students or worked at the college, but there were some locals. He moved off campus his junior year and lived about three miles outside town and the bar districts. After having quite a few beers with his friends, he decided he better walk home since he had an exam that morning. As he was walking down the country road with cornfields on either side, a man in a truck pulled up who appeared to be a friendly farmer. He offered to give my uncle a lift to save him the walk. My uncle, being drunk, and not thinking straight, took him up on his offer. He got in the front seat, and they took off. He gave the man directions to the house he lived in with his college buddies, and then about five minutes into the drive, noticed 
that the man had gone past the turn that he needed to take. He informed the man that his house was behind them and that he needed to turn around. But the old farmer man said that he had lived in this town for 50 years and knew a shortcut that he would teach him. That's when my uncle began to get suspicious. He started asking questions and surveying his situation. The farmer obviously had a final destination as he continued down the road and then eventually pulled into an old driveway with a very old barn that was falling apart. My uncle said the roof was half caved in. My uncle's plan was to bolt the second the man slowed down. So when the farmer slowed down and parked, my uncle pushed the unlock latch and gave the door a shove. The lock had been sawed off and only part of it popped up. At this point, he knew he was in for it. The driveway was made of gravel and there was a very old playground set in the front yard and was completely rusted and falling apart. There was also a shed in the back of the property, behind the barn, that he said had lights on, but the rest of the property was dark and only illuminated by the headlights of the truck and the moon. When my uncle was telling the story, he very abruptly ended it with, Then I fought him off and sprinted home. I don't think he wanted to admit it, but something obviously happened at that farm. Never accept rides from strangers.